Okay, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Happy Thursday for those that are here live. For those that are listening later, happy whatever day it is as the week continues to fly by, living in incredible times at all levels. For those that are joining us for the first time, welcome. For those that are coming back, you know, we've been talking a lot about this idea of perception. Perception is critical because if we're not aware of the level in which our brains are processing the world around us, we start to look at the world and wonder why it's not delivering more for us. We start to make bad assumptions as to what, as to what's going to make us happy. I was learning yesterday with a good friend of mine, one of the most powerful Jewish books. The book is called the Tanya. And in there, he was talking, the, the rabbi, the Baal HaTanya was talking about the idea of light and how there are things, this is how we took it out. There are things in this world that are covered with these, if you will, these shells, these spiritual shells. So you have it, but it's not filled with a lot of light. There are other things in life that may seem like they're less on the outside, but they're filled with light. And you can interact with this world and have a lot of stuff, but there's no real light in the things you have. It doesn't satisfy you. It doesn't make, it doesn't make life more alive. We see people like this. They have, some people have very little stuff and they seem to be alive. And some people have a lot of stuff and they seem to be sort of half sleeping always upset, unsatisfied. So you can say it's hunger. And I grew up under the world of Michael Jordan, so I get the idea of winning a championship and then wanting to win five more. But it's deeper than that. It comes down into the world of perception. And perception is a huge piece of how we operate. If we're going after things that are not filled with light because someone else is telling us, do that and you'll be important, we're gonna end up running after a lot of stuff that doesn't necessarily fulfill us in a very spiritual way. But until we stop for just a few seconds, which is what we do, why we do this for, and just think about the filter that is in our own brains, and just think about that schema that is tainting the world around us. We won't, we can't possibly change it because your brain isn't a muscle you can see. Your brain isn't a muscle that you can point to and go, oh, it was flabby and now it's flat. It doesn't work that way. Oh, look, I have little muscle. You see, I did this exercise. I have a lot of muscle. You can't see your brain. You're using your brain to see. How can you see your brain? So it's really hard for a person to sit around and go, oh, that's because of my perception. Versus them saying, oh, that's because reality is wrong. Unless a person starts to really look for it. And starts to monitor how they feel. And question why they feel that way. And question why they're pursuing that thing. Even if they don't change. That means even if they don't change. Just to have the clarity. Just to have the ability to... To know, I'm doing this for my ego. Okay. I'm doing this because I want people to look at me and go, you're successful. I'm doing this because I want someone to give me honor or to appreciate me. That's fine. Nothing wrong with appreciation. Nothing wrong with, with wanting a little attention. And we're going to talk maybe today, maybe tomorrow about where this stuff comes from. They're real needs that we have every single day, which is what's driving us. But, but before we even get to understanding where our needs come from, if we don't fully understand that the world around me is basically mostly invisible to me, all I'm really picking up in the world around me are small little slices of the world. And I'm picking up those slices because my brain is already programmed to look for them. 
or they come into my world in a way that is shocking, memorable. Otherwise, I'm missing it. I'm missing most of life because I'm not looking for it. And the reason why I'm not looking for it is because I haven't spent enough time recognizing that I have a very small window of attention. And I have to own that window with all of my might. Because if I don't own the window of attention in my brain, I'm going to miss things. Or when those things come into my head, they're going to come in in a certain way, with a certain feeling. And unless I'm asking myself on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, what am I yearning for? Why am I yearning for those things? What are the goals that I'm looking for? And then flip, why do I feel that way? Unless I'm becoming aware that my visions, my aspirations, my feelings are all channeling through one central station called my brain, my, my schema, I can't start to clean it. So when I search for significance, I'm searching in a way that could be wrong. When I'm searching for connection, I'm searching for a way that could be wrong. And when I'm going out in my life and doing things, the feeling that I have may be wrong. I may be upset for the wrong reasons. I may be upset because I don't know the person in front of me or I'm judging them. I may be upset because I'm going after things that I haven't really thought about. Like, do I really need it? Is that really what I want to do? Is that, is that expressing my values? I had a great conversation yesterday. Hopefully we'll be able to release the interview in the next day. For those who don't know, we have a, a program every Arab Shabbat, 530. Project Inspire does it, and it's on my, my Facebook as well. So for this week, we're, we, we we're interviewing a woman named Beatty Deutsch. Incredible. Hopefully I'll post maybe the whole interview on, uh, on, 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 our, on my platforms. Beatty Deutsch is a woman from Israel, and at 26, after four children, she started to run to get back in shape and realized that she was pretty good at it. And then she started running and running and running and running and running. And all of a sudden she started winning marathons. Now she's a professional runner trying to qualify for the Olympics in Israel. And her biggest challenge right now is not her racing, her running. Her biggest challenge is that the Olympic qualification is on Shabbat and she won't run on Shabbat. And we were talking about balance. And she said something so interesting yesterday. I was so moved by it. And hopefully I'll post the whole interview. She said that, I said, how do you balance your children? She thinks she has five children. How do you balance your children and your, your, your running, your career? And she said, you know, because she's a woman of faith, because she's a mom, in, in a way, it puts running in perspective. She wants to be remembered by her children as a great mom more than by the world as a great runner. And so as she approaches running, she in a way, there's a certain release of tension because she wants to win. She's training very hard and she's working. She's pushing herself to the, to the max, but her perspective is still, if I'm a good mom, if I'm a good Jew, I'm good. I found that to be so insightful because here's a woman that is racing, is a, is a professional athlete. And yet the perspective, what her brain takes in is prioritized by her role as a mom and her role as a woman of faith, and then her role as a professional athlete. And then that just prioritization in her mind changes her schema for how she digests information when she wins or when she loses, when she trains, or when she doesn't train which only helps her become better. She may lose a race or two, ultimately. But as she feels about herself, as she sets her priorities, the way she sees things in the world, the way she feels about her races, changes not based on winning and losing, changes based on priorities and schema. And that's how we have to live. That's how we have to realize 
that so much of our negativity that we're feeling every day is really a product of just some schema that's a little off. There's extremes that I don't want to, of course, in moments of crisis, in moments of joy, forget that. I'm talking about the middle, so much of the middle of how I feel during my day, being empowered or disempowered, walking into a room and being threatened by somebody, seeing a spouse or a child or a friend and getting mad at them quickly, blaming them, looking around and seeing what I don't have versus what I do have. Most of that comes from just my inability to recognize the priorities of my life, what I want to be, what I want to be, what I'm being driven towards and not based on whether they said the thing or did the thing or don't have that thing. Because if my priorities in life are being of value or of connecting to the depths of who I am or making a better world of bringing me out in the right way, if my, my priorities are constantly growing in being able to be proud of what I do, regardless of whether the words, world says so, if I'm working myself in a real way, if my visions are really things that I'm after, if I keep on working on my mind, my beliefs of what I want to accomplish in this world, what I want to give to this world, what I want to be remembered for in this world, why I'm in this world, if that's at least a piece of my day, the more my beliefs shift, the more the world sends the same signals in and I, I feel different. The more I walk into a room and see what I can give, not what I can get, and it feels different. I forgot who I was talking to about this recently. Oh, I was, I was watching a masterclass by a writer. I forgot which one. I think it's David Sedaris. Andy will look it up as we're talking and I'll tell you. I think it's David Sedaris. He's a writer for um, The New Yorker. And he's, I, I know what's happening right now. For those who are with us live, Andy's, I can see Andy's brain already moving and trying to find it for me. I think his last name was Sedaris. So I was watching this masterclass from him and he was saying how he lives in different um countries and part of the things that he loves is he he's a writer at his core so he wants to interact with people in real ways david i knew it i knew it for those that are here with me live on zoom by the way just for a note if you're if you're seeing this in any other platform god bless you if you happen to be with me live on zoom what you get as a bonus is andy boltax because every time i say something he's looking for it he just posts the master class with david sedaris right so david so thank you. So David Sedaris is this, um, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words. David Sedaris. Oh, and you post on Facebook too. Okay. So it's, it's, it's zoom and Facebook. Okay. So David Sedaris. Thank you, Andy. Thank you everybody. So David Sedaris tells a story over yesterday that I'm reading that I'm watching saying he's, he's, he's a storyteller by, by, by nature. This is such an insightful thing that he said. It's, it was so simple, but I, I was blown away by it. By the way, this, he, I, I, I'm not, I don't know him personally, but this, what he's about to say, what he said like yesterday, really is the measure of, of, of people that are really great. So he's this, he's this, um, this superstar writer. And he's, he's a writer at his core. And he wants stories. He wants insights. He, he, he gets his stories from the world. So he wants to interact with people in a meaningful way. So he said this thing he said that you know he lives in different countries he lives in france and he lives in england and he and one of the reasons why he does is because when he lives in certain countries he says he can never fully speak like everyone else speaks so he's not seen as like a full human being in a way it's fascinating what he says like he feels that like people don't interact with him like a regular person because he can't catch up and so he feels like he's not accepted as a regular person in his environments. So he lives in these small towns around the world. And so since he can't speak like everybody else, they don't interact with him. So they're more honest around him. 
their true colors come out. He had a line yesterday. He said, you can measure someone's character by how they treat people who they can, who they can treat poorly. This is amazing. You want to see who somebody is when they're in a room, if there's someone around them that they can treat poorly and get away with it. If you're sitting in a restaurant and you can treat the waiter poorly because there's no consequence socially for you, that person that you can tell their character by how they treat that person. It's an amazing insight. It's true. How you treat people that you don't have to treat well if you don't want to, and nothing's going to happen to you. So he says when, in, when he lives in these worlds, people, they don't treat him like one of them. So they, they're more open around him. They're not as, as intimidated by him. And they, they act more real. Their guard is down. They're not trying to be socially accepted by him. And then that's where he draws all of his content. And he says, if I could be totally, now here's a guy who is a world-class writer. He's a world-class writer. And in one town that he lives in, he would pick up garbage. because, And then they, 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 they made him like the garbage man. So here's a guy who goes home, sits in his little wherever he lives, and is celebrated across the world for his pen. And yet goes outside and is treated in such a different way. But his schema, his mind is so clear with what he wants to do and what he wants to bring to the world that it doesn't bother him that he's not been given the social respect. A normal human being who's looking for social acceptance would go outside and be treated disrespectfully and they would feel negative. But because this guy is so clear, is so focused on what he is giving to the world, as the disrespect comes into his schema, it doesn't get processed as negative. It gets processed as positive because that negativity is overshadowed by the ability to interact in a more authentic way. Think about a covert spy spying and being happy that he or she is invisible because they can gather the information to help their country. Think about a parent who is happy to be invisible so that their, their, their child could learn to walk or do that math problem on their own. So they help a little bit and they disappear, giving the child the confidence without having to say, oh, my parents did it for me. See that distinction between that and the mom and dad who hovers and solves problems only weakening a child. See the difference? It's, it's perspective. It's, it's what are we fighting for? It's are we reactive and we're looking at the world to give me something or do I superimpose my brain 2.0, my soul and say, wait, I'm here for a reason. I want to do, do more. I want to give more than I take. I want to be a soul more than a body. And so I don't look out on the world and just wait for the world to send me information. I am, I am working on my perspective constantly. So, so no matter what I engage with, I can be empowered so that I don't have to be thrown by the same things I was thrown by when I was 18 years old, just with a different consequence. I don't have to be upset by the same reasons I was upset when I was in high school, even though I'm 50 years out. It's just the, 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 the details are different. Once we start to marry what I want, who I am, and understand that all of that is not just like a nice thing to do on a Sunday morning when you have time. All of that is actually forming the beliefs that are forming the schema that is changing how we process the world. I've got work to do. But a lot of the work that we do is, is here. It's here. And it'll change us. That's why some people can walk through the world and be calm. And some people can't even walk down an, a, a quiet street and not be all razzled. That's our job. To clear 
our perspective, to clear our lenses, to always be empowered. We can talk about this in the future. This is, by the way, I'll drop with this one. This is, by the way, the, the underlying meaning of why the famous rabbi Rabbi Nachman said we have an obligation to be always happy. He doesn't mean like happy in the way that we say it. He means empowered. We have an obligation to clear our minds, to look at the world in a way that will always still be empowered. We can, we can achieve this. We can achieve this. And we need to. All right. Thanks so much for those who are tuning in now. Remember, you can always see this live on Facebook, my Facebook, Momentum's Facebook, on our Zoom for those who want it. And if you always see this on demand on my Instagram, on my Facebook, and on my uh, on Twitter, LinkedIn, or um, or YouTube. All right. Have an awesome day. And with God's help, I cannot wait to see you again tomorrow. Have a great day.